So I want to start with where my ministry started. And some of you know the story, so I won't go into it too much. It was a new Christian I offered to do kids' church. I had no training in kids' church, and quite frankly, I was quite useless. But anyway, they were desperate enough to take me on, but they didn't put me in the main church. I still resent that. They sent me to Otara. You, you can go and serve in Otara, which is 30 minutes from home. I had to go out to Otara, serve there, and then come back to church at 10 o'clock. So it was like an hour like an hour, two hours before I even got to church, got to leave about eight o'clock in the morning. So we started off with six kids, and as you know, story, sometimes there were none because I was just that good. Uh, and it was, it was an, I did that for, I don't know how long, probably for a couple of years, and um, so it all started, but when I look back on it, I know heaven was watching. Heaven saw, heaven saw, heaven saw those moments the sacrifices. We prayed for those kids like you would not believe. I moved to pray and pray for those kids. And um, ever since I was saved, I just knew it was my responsibility to serve in the house. No one had to tell me, no one had to ask me, no one had to persuade me. I just knew I had to serve in the house. And the rest, as they say, is history. Our culture serving is our privilege. Everyone say privilege. Mm. We have a place and a purpose in this family. Ephesians 2.10 is a great verse of scripture. I want to read it to you right now. For we are all his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You're created for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What, what does that mean? It simply means that this. God made the work for you before he made you for the work. Isn't that interesting, eh? God's, God's always one step ahead. So he's made this role for you, and then he made you in the eternal counsels of God. You know, way back in eternity past, he had this whole thing mapped out of exactly what you were wanting to do. And I just want to say this to you today. I believe that the, the key to life, the key to life is discovering what God made you for, what he created for you to do. And that leads to the very best life possible on planet Earth. If we don't discover that, there's always something that's going to be missing in our lives. When you find your place and move in what you are made for, you find your very best life. Listen to this point here. If God put you in it, a role, he put it in you. If he put you in it, he put it in in you. In other words, he put in you all you need to do what he has asked you and called you to do. So you can't move in what you're not made for, but when you, when you find what you're made for, then you start to fly. So birds do great because they do what they're made for. They fly. Fish in the sea, they do great because they do what they are made for. If you think about birds, they're not made to sit on ledges and hang around. They're made to move. They're made to fly, and that's when they fulfill their calling. And friends, what we are made for, we got to move in it. We don't sit in it. We don't wait in it. We don't spectate in what we are made for. We move in what we're made for. We do what we are made for, and we come into a place of satisfaction and fulfillment that is truly, truly amazing. You find joy, you're going to find fulfillment. And you know, this is what I've found. When you move in what you're made for, God always provides all you need to do it really well. It's interesting, hey? In creation, God made the sea, <laughs> you watch it, follow the story, before he made the fish. Interesting, isn't it? So he went ahead and got everything ready you know, for the, for, the, for the fish to be able to swim in the sea. He, he, he made the sky before he made the birds. <laughs> so he, God goes ahead, gets everything ready for us, so when we are born and when we find our place, everything's been put into place so that we can do what we're done, called to do and do it very, very well. Now, everything God made, you read the book in uh, Genesis, he spoke it into being. Let there be light. You know, the sky and the earth and the, all the stars and all the sun and the moon and all the rest of it. But when he made you, it's different. He didn't speak in it a bit of thing. Do you know what he did? He got down. He, made, he got down into the dirt 
and he made you by hand. He got his hands dirty, the dust of the earth, and then he made you in the image of God. <laughs> so here's the point. Even if your life is a mess, <laughs> you can still move in what you're made for because God made you from a mess anyway. He made you from the dust anyway, and so don't ever disqualify yourself from serving because you think you're not okay, you think you're a mess, you think you're a shamble. It does not matter. That's how it started. Move in what you are made for, and I reckon that's a process of becoming whole on the inside. It's a part of how God renews us and revives us and fulfills us and satisfies us because we're moving in what we're made for. So tell the person next to you, move in what you were made for. <laughs> we do and I do people an enormous favor when I encourage them to serve because I'm helping them define life don't ever feel bad about encouraging someone to serve because it's going to fulfill and satisfy their lives in ways that they've probably not yet experienced before. And then what I found, when you pour out for God, God pours into you. You know, it's interesting. I was in Adelaide, as I said, and I had to do all these sessions. And, you know, I just poured out for God. I just poured out. I just kept going. I just, you know, it was kind of amazing. I just had to keep going. And in between, I was talking to people and talking with pastors and all the rest of it. So, you know, it was for a number of, I just, I just kept pouring out and pouring out and pouring out. And then by the time I got to the, the fifth, sixth session, I'm telling you, I was on fire. <laughs> and as I began to reflect on it, what had happened is that I, as I had poured out for God and poured out, God had poured into me. And he had poured into me. He had filled me. As I, you know, the more you, it's amazing with God. The more you give out, the more he puts in. And so he kept filling me up and filling me up. And so it just got better and better. After the last service, I was really, when's the next meeting, please? They said, no, you've got to get on a plane and go home. We've had enough of you. I said, but I've not had enough of you guys. I want to, I want to preach a little bit more. And they said to me, I was driving home after the last service. They said, you must be tired. I said, I'm not tired. I'm, I'm energized. I'm ready to move. I'm ready to do more. What's the point here? When you pour out for God, he pours into you. And you know there's nothing better than God pouring himself into you. Is that right? You get more of God, and it's just, it's, it's just such a satisfying and such a wonderful thing to do in our lives. You know, here's a, um, here's a testimony that I heard recently. They said as soon as they started serving, their permanent residency came through. And they connected serving with a miracle. Another person, another husband told me a number of years ago, he came, he came up to me and said, look, I just want you to know something. He said, I'm one of those people I could always hear from God. He was one of those blessed, graced people, always hear from God. But he said, do you know what? He said, it stopped for 18 months. And I said, well, what happened? He said, well, my wife had a baby, and so I stopped serving. 18 months, he said, I couldn't hear the voice of God. I got back into serving, and I can hear God once again. Friends, there's a great connection. You see, serving opens up the heavens. It, because, well, of course it does. It has to. Why? Because you're doing what you're made for. Now, I must admit, you know, we serve, we serve in the community as well. You know, we serve at work. We serve in the home. But we also serve in the church. It's not either or. It's both and. We do all of those things together. Corey Tim Boone put it this way. The measure of a life, after all, is not its duration, but its donation. <laughs> you know, some people live to 30 like Jesus. 30? 33, like Jesus, and his donation is far more than those who live to 80 or 90. Some people just want to live long. <laughs> well, good for you. We all want to, but that's not the issue. The issue is what's your donation? What are you doing? <laughs> you know, some people live long, make, make more of a mess of life. They're better have, have gone earlier because they cause too much damage and trouble. So it's our donation that matters, really. So let's go to Matthew chapter. Are you okay out there, by the way? Yeah. Don't, don't be afraid of an amen from time to time. It's, uh, I like that. Uh, Matthew 20, but if you don't like what I'm saying, we'll say amen anyway. <laughs> amen, pastor, hurry up and finish. Uh, Matthew 20, 25 to 28. Uh, but Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. 
And whoever desires to be first among him, let him be, be among you, let him be your slave. Read the last one with me, verse 28. Come on, let's go together. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Say it again. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served. It's not all about serving me, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. If we are followers of Jesus, <laughs> we come to serve. That's it. So greatness, the greatest in the kingdom of God are the servants. So I think becoming a servant is one of the greatest qualities to ask God to develop in our lives. So we can be great, not in the eyes of man, but great in the kingdom of God. Great in the eyes of God. Martin Luther King Jr. put it this way. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Tell the person next to you, you can be great. Yeah, you can be great. You can be great. Man, some of us, why we look at these superstars out there and we see what they're doing and, you know, maybe you follow NBA or soccer or whatever and you say, look at all these great people here, have a dream to be great. Forget all that rubbish, friends. You can be great by serving God. That's the greatest greatness of all. Far greater than all that other stuff. I'm not against that stuff, but hey, true greatness is what we want. Nothing liberates our greatness like the desire to help and the desire to serve. Wow. You know, church life is all about involvement with others. It's what, it's what it is. It's what we're a fa Aren't we a family? Yes. So we're involved with one another. So we use our gifts to serve one another. Ephesians 4, 16, the New Living Testament puts it this way. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps other parts grow. So the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Each part does its special role, its special work. Each part, every part. Can I remind you of a story I've shared a number of years ago with you? I don't know how long ago this was, maybe 20 years ago. I was a pastor. And, and I visited this church, quite a sizable church in, um, in, in Auckland. And I, I walked in the doors, and the welcome was average. I'll, I'll let that pass. And then I walked into the auditorium, and it was quite full. And so I started looking for a seat. And I was struggling for a seat, and I thought, can someone please help me to find a seat, you know? Um, because it was, it was, the side rows were full, middles were kind of... And so I wandered around, and uh, man, I felt awkward, I felt uncomfortable. And then finally, I managed to get myself into a seat. And as I, once I got into that seat, as a pastor who's reasonably confident, I said to myself, I will never go back to that church again. And I never have, friends. Why? Because I realized then how important first impressions are. How important the car park is. Honestly, some people will not return to a church because the car park wasn't run well. How important the door welcome is. You know, welcome, welcome, Tark. So great to see you this morning. Glad you've come, as opposed to. <laughs> you know, traffic, golf, traffic, you know, traffic waters. You know, well, I don't know how they do it, but they point this way. Uh, you know, and, and the ushers. They're game breakers. So. First impressions are so important. And you know, some of these roles are so easy. <laughs> Stand on the door. I mean, you're here anyway. Nice smile. Point them the right door. Whatever it is. I sh you, do, you know, there. So this is what I... The, when you think of serving, if you're just starting in serving, I want you to think this way. Minimum effort, maximum return. So it's not a big job. You know, even, even with ushering, not even rostered every week. You know, I don't know how often they rost you, but not very often. And I'll, can I remind you of this story of this man who visited this church, and then when he died, a few years later, he left his entire estate to that church. I wish it was ours. It was $178,000. Today, be worth millions of dollars. Everyone say millions of dollars. And do you know why he left it to that church? He said he was a terrible time in his life. He was lonely and feeling downcast. He went to the church. He said the welcome was so wonderful, the warmth in that church. He said, I never, ever forgot it. And he left millions of dollars to the church. Listen up, ushers. Listen up, door people. Listen up, car park. 
don't rob us of an inheritance of millions of dollars, <laughs> all right, by not giving a warm, friendly welcome, all right? So tell the person next to you with a big smile, hey, welcome to church this morning. So good to see you. <laughs> Gosh. The word serve, service, you know how many times found in the Bible? 1,416. 1,416. My Bible has 1,120 pages which means serving is mentioned more than once per page, obviously not on every page, but more than once per page. Christianity is all about serving. Yeah. It's really what it comes down to. And it's our privilege, it's, it's not our burden. And so the goal for us is to have everyone in the house serving. 1 Peter 4 term, each one should use whatever gift he has received yeah. to serve others. Do you know, in a family like that, we all depend on one another, even up on the belt, we depend on one another, all of us. We really do, and uh, it's just like your body, all right? You depend on all the other parts to do their bits, and how many of you know that one part of your body doesn't function properly, it's not good? Anyone, ever, has anyone ever experienced that? Yeah, well, you all know that, don't we? So, uh, for me to speak requires the involvement of my brain. Some of you are saying, well, please use it. Anyway, <laughs> my brain, <laughs> my nerves, my tongue, my jaw, my lips, my larynx, diaphragm, heart, veins, arteries, and much, much more. If one of those refuses to function, I would struggle to speak. Interdependent. For our church to function as God intends it, fulfill its calling, we need everyone doing their part. And what happens is this, hope you don't mind me saying, if one part of the church isn't functioning as expected, it's because there's some people who are not moving in what they were made for. Because yeah. all the people we need are here. Yeah. It's just, that, I know you're probably all the servers are here. They're, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, they're probably out there that aren't serving. But Zig Ziglar put, put it this way. He said, you can have everything in life you want if you'll just help another, enough other people get what they want. So true. Wow. Pour into others, God pours into us. Serve others. We get served. <laughs> Do you know what our problem is? Do you know what my problem is? We're very self-focused. It's, it's all about me. It really is. And some of you say, no, no, I've got past it. Have you? Test. If I gave you a photo and you're in it, who are you going to look for first? <laughs> Come on. Who do you look for first? I know you all look for me, but second, after me... <laughs> Who do you look for? Seth? You, come on, folks. Come on, listen, 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 please. It's time to look at someone else first. It's time to care for someone else first. President Kennedy said, ask not what the nation can do for you, ask what you can do for the nation. Ask not what you can do for the church, ask not what the church can do for you, ask what you can do for the church, because when you do what you need to do for the church, the church will do what it needs to do for you, sowing and reaping. It's not rocket science, it's pretty straightforward. They did this survey. Uh, how many of you know God's call on your life? Oh, this is gonna shock and terrify us, all right? How many of you know what God's call on your life is? Do you know what the survey re result? This is a number of years, 10%. 10%. One on 10. Then they would say, okay, of that 10%, how many of you are fulfilling God's call on your life? 5%. This is a Western church. Here's a question. If 5% of your body parts were functioning, you would not be alive. Is that right? 5%. If 5% of the church is functioning as it should be, that's why the Western church is struggling so much. Struggling to impact community, struggling to bring transformation and to see the expansion of the kingdom of God. It's not about, you know the parable of the talents, five, three, and one. Five made five more, two made two more, and the one buried his talent in the sand. And then they took the one from, the one talent gave it to the person with the 10. Buried it in the ground. Can I encourage you not to leave your talents buried in the ground? What is the richest place in the world? You all know it, don't you? It's a cemetery. 
It's a cemetery. Do you know why? Because there lie talents never used, books never written, songs never composed, hopes never fulfilled, leadership never developed. Don't leave your talents buried in your grave. Just don't do it, please. I'm encouraging you. Use what you've got. At the end of his life, great scientist Einstein removed the portraits of Newton and Maxwell, two more scientists from his wall. He had them up on his wall. They were his heroes. They were the people that he wanted to be like. He removed those and he replaced them with Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, and Albert Schweitzer. He replaced the image of success with the image of serving. He wanted those who gave their lives to serve humanity to be his heroes, to inspire him. I want to ask you the question, who are your heroes? Who do you have on the walls of your, ch your bedroom wall? More than that, who do you have on the walls of your heart? Who do you want to be like? Choose carefully because the impact they have on you will be phenomenal. We're made to serve, to serve the Lord. 1 Samuel 10, verse 26. Saul went to his house at Gibeah, and the valiant men whose hearts God had touched went with him. You know what I like about that verse? Saul needed support and help. And the ones who went with him were those that God touched their hearts. It's not their wife or husband touched their hearts. It wasn't the children that touched their hearts. It wasn't their parents that touched their hearts. It wasn't the pastor who touched their hearts. To serve, it was God. That's my prayer today is that I can say as much as I like, but I know it's not going to do a lot unless God touches your heart, unless the Holy Spirit touches your heart. And that's what happened to me when I was first saved. Holy Spirit just said, Tuck, come on, serve. Forty odd years later, friends, I've never, ever, ever stopped serving. It's been my joy. It's been my greatest privilege in life. I can't imagine anything more wonderful than serving my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. As I wrap this up, I was wondering whether I should say this or whether I shouldn't, but I'm going to say it. You have a rugby team, 15 players. If three players said, we're not going to play, that rugby team will lose. Is that right? You all understand that? You know, I don't know what the other campuses are like, but here at Church Unlimited West, we have about 40% serving and 60% no. You know what that does? It just makes it really hard. Really, really hard to run the ship. Really hard. We have people getting emotionally drained trying to keep this thing going. And I, I don't want to... <laughs> I'm just giving you the facts. So all I'm saying is, if you can help... It's going to be really helpful. <laughs> all right, here's my last scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The day is coming, my friends. Where I will stand before God. You will stand before God, and he'll say, what did you do with the gifts I gave you? How did you use them? How did you serve? And based on that, your eternal rewards forever and ever and ever will be determined. I'm honest and sincere when I say I'm doing you a great favor as I share this message with you because I want you ready because they're going to, I might get to heaven one day and, G and, and you might get to heaven one day and Jesus will say, well, what church did you go to? And you're going to say, well, I went to Church Unlimited. Well, who was the pastor there? So it was Tarkbana. Well, did he not tell you about this judgment seat? So I've told you. <laughs> I've told you. That will be the most incredible day of your life, the most important day of your life. Everything you do for the rest of your days is for that one day. And you stand before your creator and you give an account. And you, you want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. You, you know, you serve God diligently and faithfully with the gifts that he gave you. I want you to consider tithing your time to serving in the house. 
just a tithe, 10%. Because most of our staff do that. <laughs> Many of our staff <laughs> give 20%, 30% more than we have to do um, to serve in God's house. I just throw that out as a thought um, you might want to consider. And last thing I want to say is, you know, the enemy is a thief. And the thing he'll do is want you to procrastinate. What he says, well, what you say in your heart is, well, one day I'm going to do this. And you feel it's like a Panadol, isn't it? Like, oh, I feel okay now, because one day I'm going to do it. But sometimes one day never comes. Yeah. You know, when the kids are a bit older, the mortgage is paid off, when they don't have two jobs, you know, finish my studies, whatever it might be. Um, don't, don't let procrastination. I, I would say start today. We all want to be an army, but in an army, we want Church Unlimited. Who wants Church Unlimited to be a mighty army? Yeah. Yeah, we do, don't we? Do you know what about thing about an army? There's no spectators. Everybody's involved, front line, back line, middle line, some line somewhere. And um, we all have to move in what we were made for. Individually, we're not much. But together, using our gifts, boy, we're a force to be reckoned with. We become a force that can change your life, can change your family, can change our community, can change our city, can change our nation. As we join together, we can significantly advance the kingdom of God, and I believe, bring revival and turn this nation to Jesus. Thanks for watching Running With Fire with Tark Barna from Church Unlimited. Church Unlimited meets in a number of locations across New Zealand and overseas. We would love to have you as our guest. 